This is the very final day of one of the most ambitious history exhibitions that Aratoi has mounted, Featherston Military Training Camp, the record of a remarkable achievement which illustrates the great sacrifice that New Zealand made to the First World War, training over 60,000 men here in the Wairarapa for the front lines in Europe. So I want to take you on a journey with these men. We are grateful to lenders from all over the country for sharing their personal stories, their family stories that have never been told or shared before in public. And this is the very first opportunity over the last six months we've been able to welcome people to Masterton to tell these stories very unique to the region. New Zealand had been at war for nearly a year and Trentham Camp in Upper Hutt had suffered disease outbreaks due to overcrowding. The building of a new camp in Featherston was therefore authorised by the Minister of Defence. The site offered several advantages. It was close to Wellington, had ample free draining land with space for large-scale training activities, bracing weather conditions and fresh water from the Tauheraniko River. By September 1915, 150 civilian tradesmen had been recruited to work on the site, and this number increased to nearly a thousand at the height of construction. Accommodating this large labour force became a priority, so as barracks, hutments in New Zealand were built, the workers were able to move out of the tents they had been living in. The camp was as modern and as comfortable as resources would permit. It was lit by 3,000 lights which ran off two 75 kilowatt generators in an on-site powerhouse. Other innovations included drainage for carrying off surface water, metalled roads crisscrossing the camp, and a line of privately run shops. Something was working successfully at Trentham Camp. A delegation of representatives from the churches lobbied the authorities for permission to build religious institutes to cater for the needs of soldiers with strong denominational allegiances. The proposed site of the camp expanded as the need to increase the rate of reinforcement to the New Zealand Expeditionary Force grew. Originally modelled on Trentham's capacity of around 2,500 men, Featherston's hutment capacity was soon increased to 4,500. The size of the administration and storage buildings were enlarged accordingly, adding to Featherston Camp's growing dominance on the landscape. Around 300 workmen were still constructing the camp when it opened without ceremony on 24th of January 1916. The main road running through the camp, today's State Highway 2, was placed under military control to discourage civilian loitering. To the north were the hutments and cookhouses, while across the road to the south were the shops, religious institutes, and beyond the hospital wards. The horse stables were located east of the hutments, while the stores, administrative buildings and post office were located centrally alongside the main road through camp and the railway siding. Two infantry training grounds were located at what was known as Burt's and Alga's paddocks. Alongside the main camp and located at the southern end was a tent camp known as Canvas Camp, where troops went for a short period of toughening up prior to leaving for overseas service. This camp accommodated about 2,500 troops. A large staff was needed to manage the camp. Overall operations were run from the administrative area, which included headquarters for day-to-day -day operations, the pay office, orderly rooms for each unit, and quartermasters and supply stores. Nearby, the camp post office, certainly the busiest building in the camp, had 17 staff and a motor van for transporting mail between passing trains. The task of tracing each soldier's career through the camp, such as promotions or infringements, was maintained by the records office. Provisioning Featherston Camp involved the organisation of military resources on a grand scale. The site occupied roughly 164 acres, or 66 hectares, while the training grounds surrounding the camp covered more than twice this area, 474 acres. At any one time, there could be up to 8,500 soldiers living on site. Accommodation consisted of 90 large hutments, each 36 and a half metres by 6 metres wide. Camp cooks prepared food in six cookhouses, each catering for 1,500 men. 
Meals were taken in eight dining rooms, each of which could seat 600, while the officers' dining hall seated 200. Supplies were freighted into camp on a rail line which branched off the main Wellington Napier Railway. 21 tonnes of food was prepared daily, and 1,818 litres of milk were consumed. Camp ovens could bake up to 300 loaves of bread at a time. The camp was established to provide training for several different types of soldiers. Many Māori enlisted with regular army units throughout New Zealand and trained at Featherston, while many non-commissioned officers from Featherston transferred to the Māori reinforcement contingents throughout the war. The Featherston Camp Weekly newspaper of July 1918 recorded that there were 134 Māori and 90 Cook Islands troops training at Featherston Camp at that time. Combat training included firing weapons and bayonet practice as well as training in the use of specialist equipment. Foot soldiers made up the bulk of New Zealand's armed forces. These troops usually underwent initial training at Trentham Camp before entering Featherston, when more intensive training was given by drill and combat instructors. Training would occur on one of the camp's nearby grounds while musketry shooting training took place at Papawai with rifles and for selected troops, machine guns. Field artillery units, which trained with large guns towed by teams of horses, practiced firing on ranges beyond the camp at Morrison's Bush. Like the artillery, mounted riflemen had the important duty of caring for the horses. A troop of 500 horses were housed in 20 stables, each accommodating 25 animals. Daily routines of feeding and watering, tending to riding equipment, cleaning stables and training exercises in the surrounding countryside had to be carried out. Some men were selected to train as farriers so that they could shoe horses and medical care was provided by a veterinary hospital staffed by the New Zealand Veterinary Corps. The specialised units that trained at Featherston included machine gunners and engineer signallers, whose specialty was the operation of communication equipment such as field telephones and semaphore signalling flags. Tauheraniko Racecourse was briefly occupied by mounted riflemen evacuated from Trentham in July 1915. This group moved north three weeks later to the nearby Williams Farm to establish Tauheraniko Camp, where soldiers always lived under canvas. Apart from occasional use as an overflow camp, in June 1917, Tauheraniko was a segregation camp with the function of isolating new recruits from cross-infection. From late 1917, its purpose was to strengthen physically less fit men for military service. Papawai Camp was a 13-kilometre march from Featherston Camp. Papawai Camp grew up alongside Papawai Rifle Range, which had been in use since the 1880s. A canvas camp for up to 500 men was planned and several buildings eventually constructed, including a dining hall, cookhouse and even a YMCA institute. Artillery, mounted rifles and machine gun units received training at Papawai Camp while infantry marched from Featherston to use the rifle ranges. After the war, the Reparation Board turned Tauheraniko into a training farm for returned servicemen. While there, men could learn skills such as poultry and pig breeding, horticulture and market gardening. For the more physically inclined, events and competitions provided an outlet for a bit more rough and tumble, such as boxing and rugby tournaments. The centrally located YMCA Soldiers Club and various religious institutes were staffed by chaplains and offered a place for quiet games such as chess or cards, reading and contemplation. Letter writing to family and friends was encouraged as often as each man could manage it, although finding a spare desk at which to write could sometimes be a challenge, especially if there was an influx of new recruits into camp. Men with a literary inclination found an outlet for writing in several camp publications, which by 1918 included a Featherston Camp Weekly newspaper, with contributors writing under pseudonyms such as Philistine and Haka. Camp facilities eventually extended to a 400-seat picture theatre and concert hall, which screened silent films set to live music performed by camp bands. 
1918 Kemp publication, Khaki Christmas, described the concert hall as being set up for roller skating and indoor hockey. A soldier's entertainment committee oversaw entertainment for the troops, which sometimes included visiting concert parties, with one concert in July 1916 playing to an audience of 1,500 soldiers. Soldiers of the C1 camp even formed their own C1 comedy company. Interaction between troops and Wairarapa people was inevitable with such a large concentration of military personnel in one area. Soldiers granted leave soon found their way by troop train or car into nearby towns where they visited relatives, dined or perhaps attended dances while others took the train into Wellington. He was, he was my grand, grandmother's older brother, I think, wasn't he? Yeah. Older brother. Your great uncle. My great uncle, yes. He, he died in 1949, and after his wife died shortly after that, my grandmother, well, was just inherited, I suppose, his bits and pieces. Some of them were like the uniform jacket. I don't think we, I never knew that. Yes, so this was on loan now from Dr. Aaron Fox and in Gore in South Island. Yes, well, um, he would have acquired it from the family at one stage or another. Mm. I don't quite know when. Mm. A bit like his sidearms, uh, his Webley pistol went to a collector in Riverston on Gore and a captured German Luger went to the same collector. But um, that was when I was in my early teens, mm -hmm. 19. 60s. Um, the, the two on the camels at the Sphinx were, uh, that was Christmas 1913, um, they were Christmas leave before Gallipoli, and uh, the other the, on the right is uh, at the time Lieutenant James Harvest, later, later Brigadier and Member of Parliament from Invercargill, but they were both at that stage about 22, 23 years old and having a good time. And Major McCurdy, he was, after Gallipoli, he was posted to General, General Staff Headquarters in Europe. Uh, one newspaper uh, item mentions that he was the first New Zealander posted to Europe in World War I, although I understand it was the tunnelling company which was a couple of days earlier. He uh, mentioned in dispatches from General Haig three times, plus an OBE at the end of the war. He died before I was born. Um, I didn't, not a lot was talked about him, really, especially the war days. From France, he's writing back to New Zealand, so it's a very interesting trajectory from his time here. Is there anything that stands out for you? and what you've read? Um, some of the letters to his mother, um, I could I could feel yeah, a lot behind the letters when he was writing to his mother and yeah, was thinking what it would be like, how awful it would be like for his mother getting the letters and um, he was mentioning people through here that I don't know personally, but um, I could relate to people from Greytown or wherever and say, oh, that's, that would have been, you know, and he was obviously sick, or he had obviously seen them during his different stays at different camps, or he knew that they were no longer there. Tell us the story of Lance Sergeant James Ross Moody. My father. Uh, born in 1897, uh, he was 45 when I was born, so when he went to the First World War he was 19 and that photo of him was actually taken at Featherston Camp before his departure. He was very game and this is a sideline to him going off to war but this is an example of how 
ready he was to take a family of five camping and he was a man who worked in an office in a three-piece suit all his life uh, and he took us camping one year, mo mother and kit in the front seat, three children squabbling in the back seat, a very small trailer and we drove all the way to Cape Ranga in a Vauxhall 12 and back again and that must have been non-stop because he had two weeks annual leave and that was it, back to his three-piece suit <laughs> and his office. But he was, he was a good dad, yes. He didn't ever speak of the war. He put his medals on, such as they were, every uh, Anzac Day and paraded around Seatoon where we lived. Um, I was a girl guide and all that, so I was marching behind and proudly saw my dad with the RSA. Uh, but he didn't really say any more than show us his medals and perhaps one or two things that he brought back from the war. So this exhibition has been a wonderful incentive for me personally to actually open all the boxes that he saved. He saved everything. He saved bus tickets, he saved a letter from a doctor in Ireland to say that he was indisposed by the flu and he couldn't return to wherever he was meant to return. Um, he saved all the postcards and photographs and letters. And so Be a Good Boy and Stay in New Zealand came from his uncle who was already over in the war in Egypt. And he was advising Ross not to, obviously, not to get involved. But Ross was quite a, I think, conscientious chap and of course knew others. His brother had been, he was ahead, at, he was at the war already and his uncle, another uncle. So there were several family members and also some friends. He had worked in Taranaki in uh, Pātea before he left. And so I think some of those boys probably influenced him to go as well. And it was a, an exciting thing to do, I imagine, in those days. You didn't know what you were getting into. And otherwise, he was, you know, grew up on a farm south of Palmerston, north in Tokamaru, and went to work. He did study, so he ended up in, um, well, he started his working life in New Zealand when he came back from the war in the state hydro electricity. And you have this beautiful gold medallion here. Could you maybe yes. describe what this is, how, how this came to this you? has his initials on one side and on the reverse uh, Tokamaru's recognition. So the young people who came back from the war were presented with one of these gold medallions from this small township of Tokamaru, which was quite a, um, you know, a major gift I would have mm. thought. The front, to the front, where our mates need a spell. Land At the completion of training, the Rimutaka March was a rite of passage for many infantry who trained at Featherston Camp. Their destination was Wellington, and the ships waiting to carry them from New Zealand to the war for which they had long been preparing. After arriving in England, most New Zealand troops went to Sling Military Training Camp on the windswept Salisbury Plain. The men called it a godforsaken place if ever there was one. It was freezing in winter and infested with rats. Well, Slim was a terrible place as far as we were concerned. Basic army training for um, infantry. Shooting, marching, parade ground drill. And the session always finished up in what they called the bull ring, which was supposed to convert civilians into soldiers. And uh, it was very, very effective too. They were tough. At the end of training, they paraded for His Majesty King George V. And there to witness the presentation of medals for bravery was Prime Minister Massey, 
who as leader of the government travelled to England for imperial war conferences. Trained and equipped, the New Zealand Division reached France in April 1916. After nearly eight months without let-up and without gain, the mutilated units departed from Gallipoli. Refreshed and reformed in Egypt, the cavalry now became involved in a totally different kind of war. Again uniting with the Australians, they formed the Anzac Division against their old adversary, the Turks, but this time over the barren wastes of Egypt and Palestine. The Western Front was a line of trenches running through the western edge of Belgium and northern France, with the German armies to the east and the Allies to the west. The newly formed New Zealand Division learns Western Front trench warfare in the Armentier nursery sector, occupying the front line and carrying out trench raids against the German units across no man's land. The Somme Battle of 1916 is New Zealand's bloodiest battle in its military history. In mid-September 1916, 15,000 men of the New Zealand Division joined the battle in the second big push. Nearly 6,000 are wounded and 2,000 killed. They concentrated every artillery weapon that they had. They were just wheel to wheel. And I think zero hour was it just as it breaking dawn. And the whole place blew up, you see it just like in a volcano erupting. The whole of the artillery all opened up and away she went. 0310 hours, the 7th of June. Huge mines detonate in tunnels under the German lines. In the confusion, New Zealand troops advance and capture the low ridge on which lie the ruins of Messine village. The New Zealanders pay a heavy price 3,700 killed or wounded in three days. The first tanks came over the scenes because they were only five miles an hour, but um, they put the fear of him up in North and Blazers was coming over and he saw those. Neither did we, but they, they were ferocious looking things. You just imagine having a <laughs> weapon of that sort, uh, having a steel monster coming at you, you can imagine how demoralizing it was. When the whistle blew, you just got up and took your... There was flashing and noise going and shells dropping. You'd keep up as close as possible to your own barrage. And while, while the jerry was dazed, you'd hop in. Centre left, Manfred von Richthofen the Red Baron, the world's first flying ace. Aerial warfare was just in its infancy. New Zealanders who were smitten by the thrill of flying paid to be trained privately in Auckland and Christchurch before joining the Royal Flying Corps. Now, a load would be normally 250 high explosives and four Coopers or 312 pound high explosives. And that was there as a course of target. We had no aids to navigation. We had a compass and that was all. And that often varied. Consequently, that the whole thing was visual. They used the tracer bullet quite a lot because uh, as we sat on the petrol tank, one bullet in there, and well, of course, that was a good exit in this world for you. There's no parachutes. Uh, it was said by the, the higher ups that uh, if a pilot could bring his machine home, even although it might have caught fire. It was much better than him coming down in a parachute and leaving his machine in the air and really wasting good machines. That's the way they put it, but of course they weren't flying the damn thing. Flying was a clean war, but on the ground, winter conditions made life unbearable. Ghastly hell, it was just mud, mud, mud. Trenches half full of mud. And you're wet through for all the In a series of actions, the Allies attempt to break out of the Ypres salient. On 4th of October 1917, the New Zealanders launch a successful assault on Gravenstaffel Spur. 
On 12th of October, the New Zealanders face a devastating defeat at Bellevue Spur. 846 men die in just a few hours, with another 2,700 wounded. For even more than the Somme, Passchendaele symbolises the futility of trench warfare. Many died of exposure or drowned in the shell holes in which they had sought shelter. Oh, frightful. You've no idea what it was like. You lived in dugouts and you were pretty well over your ankles in mud all the time. Uh, you had no protection. You just had a ground sheet over you. You wake up in the morning with the snow over your feet and you were everlastingly in dampness. March 1918, Second Battle of the Somme. After Russia withdrew from the war, Germany moved more than 30 divisions to the Western Front and launched a huge attack. The New Zealand Division rushed to the Somme region to support the British line and played a vital role in halting the German attack. The cost is 5,000 killed or wounded between March and June. The 1918 German Spring Offensive was the decisive battle of the war, a huge gamble. Close to a million German troops were in position, with massive concentration of guns and ammunition. The Battle of Bapome is the only time in New Zealand's military history that three Victoria Crosses have been awarded during the one military action. This offensive decisively defeated the armies of Imperial Germany. More than 18,000 New Zealand soldiers fought in this battle. The New Zealand Division would go on to play a key role in the remainder of this offensive, a military action that eventually ended the war. The war town of Le Quinois remained occupied by German troops. The New Zealand Division advanced either side of the town, hoping the enemy would retreat. The rifle brigade was tasked to capture the city. It approached carefully without the usual artillery barrage. A small group from the 4th Battalion New Zealand Rifle Brigade scaled the wall by ladder, with Lieutenant Leslie Averill being the first man on the ramparts. The German garrison quickly surrendered without harm to the French population. Following upon this initial success, practically the whole battalion streamed quickly in single file along the lower wall and up the single ladder. Within a few minutes, the whole battalion engaged in the vicinity had swarmed up the ladder and were pushing into the beleaguered town. The cost of maintaining our division in France for two and a half years was appalling. Our total casualties were 18,500 dead, nearly 50,000 wounded, many twice or more. This was a terrible price to pay when our population then was just over a million. In their rejoicings at the signing of the armistice, which brings to an end the agony of the past four years, the people of New Zealand give thanks to Almighty God for the men living and dead of the New Zealand Division. The camps were empty by December 1918 and their buildings were sold off. A few still remain in use in Martinborough and Featherston. But the Featherston camp is now what it was to begin with and will hopefully remain now forever, fertile farmland. You have known a lad in town with a uniform of brown. He was modest, unassuming in his ways. If you crossed his path by chance, you would rarely turn to glance and never give a thought to sing his praise. But when now he's to the front, off to bear the battle brunt, we give him all the comfort that we can. And there's nothing for the camp, or in action, or on tramp, like a rousing song to cheer a fighting man.